Hi, everyone. I'm just going to give people a few minutes to kind of trickle in here, but welcome. Wow, wow. I think most of us are used to a Zoom existence probably at this point. So um, yeah, when you come in, if you could mute, um, that would be great. Otherwise I will mute you. Um, but then obviously we, you know, you can unmute too, but a lot of, oh, there we go. One reason I like to have everyone muted too is for feedback, um, yeah. All right, um, here, so a lot of people trickling in, that's good. Oh, we got people, I, I gotta get used to <laughs> managing all these screens again. Yay, good morning, good morning, people writing. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. Yay, first day of class, woohoo. I'm a, I'm a morning person. <laughs> if I keep telling myself that, it'll happen one day. Um, great, well, um, cool, let's, Let's like, let's give people a couple more minutes. I think it might, there's a good chance people might need to update their Zoom. Um, so I will do that, give people a few minutes. While I do that, I will get up what I need to look at here and get ready to share that. Let's see, 23. Yeah, we're like at half capacity right now, which is decent, but not so great. Now give people just a minute or so. Good morning. Yay, good morning. Um, before I get started, I guess I'll say um, so I noticed some of you here have a photo um, for your Zoom background. And please, if you don't have a photo or if you updated Zoom and Zoom removed your photo, which I guess happens sometimes, um, please do upload a photo. Um, I, in the past, when this class was in person, I actually would memorize everybody's name and get to know everyone uh, pretty, pretty well. And um, so photos help, photos definitely help. It's kind of like um, a lot easier to memorize people's name or get to know you if, uh, if you have a photo. So make a note to do that when you get a chance. Um, here, let's go to view. I guess I'll get out of here, whoa. And I guess I'll just start, I guess I'll start because like I say, like I like to say, the sooner we get started, the sooner we can be finished. <laughs> um, all right, so hopefully you can see a screen here. I Hopefully you should be able to see that. If you can't see that, let me know in the chat. Good, good. Okay, great. Well, I'll, I'll just say again, even though people are probably gonna be trickling in, uh, I really wanna welcome you all here to Plant Kingdom. Uh, my name is Dr. Rebecca Panko, and one thing I like to say at the beginning of every, and you can just call me Rebecca. Um, you, you can call me Dr. Panko, whatever you want, but not whatever you want. <laughs> but Rebecca is fine. Rebecca is fine. Um, yeah, and I like to say this at the beginning of all my Plant Kingdom courses that, that I know every single person in here wanted to take a plant class. That was like, out of all the things that you could do, 
is you were hoping, oh, please, please, goodness gracious, let me be able to take a plant class, right? Oops, wait, I lost my, I lost my thing now, hold on. One second, where is Zoom? Somebody's asleep? <laughs> yeah, please mute. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I can do it here, but it's a little trickier because I'm managing a lot of screens. <laughs> but yes, so I know I know every single person here is like it, they're totally in love with plants. Plants is your favorite thing in the world. And this was the class that you had to take to satisfy uh, your life streams, right? Well, no, I know that everyone here, there might be a couple people here who enjoy plants and who like plants. But I know the majority of people here are here because they had to take the class to get credits to be able to graduate. And you're all hoping to become uh, doctors or dentists or other things like this, right? So much. Hi, Joanna. Hey, Joanna. You need to mute, honey. Hi, Professor. Hi. I, I, I don't know if it's you, but somebody needs to mute. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There, maybe it's not you. Okay. Yeah, guys, please mute um, when you come into the room. It'd be a lot easier. I'd like to get through this. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Hala. <laughs> I know I can, but there's like five things popped up on my screen right now. Hala's like, you can mute her. I'm like, yeah, well, I do know that. <laughs> it's just hard to manage all these things at the same time. All right. Forget it. You're here to play at class, whether you like it or not. <laughs> um, my goal is to make you guys at the end of this class, or maybe before the end of this class, um, you know, enjoy plants and look at plants in a different way and maybe even want to study some someday. Uh, so yeah, Dr. Rebecca Pinko, you can call me Rebecca. This is my email address if you need to get in touch with me at any time. I'm very good at turning around, like uh, email turnaround time, usually within 24 hours, unless it's a weekend. Um, so feel free to email me anytime. Uh, before I go into the class, just so you guys have a little bit background about me. So I am... I've been studying plants for over 20 years. Um, my parents were national park rangers and I um, have lived in a lot of different places because of that, mostly New York and Florida have been the two places, but then I've worked in a lot of different um, temporary positions in areas all over the world. Um, I am originally from Brooklyn, New York, uh, where I have lived for a really long time. Um, but yes, oh, and so one thing, so even though I've gone to all these different places all over the US mostly and studied, and you might look at some of these pictures and be like, wow, she's in a forest. Wow, she's by a mountain, right? Um, ooh, these are like far away places. No, like the picture of me on the bottom, right? That's me in Jersey. Like <laughs> the picture of me on the left, um, that's me not too far outside of the city too. So the reason why I point that out is because um, my dissertation work at Rutgers uh, Newark and New Jersey Institute of Technology focused on studying the plant evolution of species that live in cities. So my dissertation work actually focused on um, plants in New York City, in New York City. So why I mention this is because you don't have to go to the Amazon. You don't have to go to South America or some, you know, Micronesia, you don't have to go to Bali or anything like that to study plants. You can study plants in New York City. You can study plants in Newark. You can study plants in Journal Square. You can study plants anywhere. You know why? Because plants, they're everywhere. So I focused on this little weedy species in New York City called Shepherd's Purse. This is what it looks like. You'll be seeing it later this spring. And just to give you a little background of why I study things like this is because, so when you think of New York City, and I'm guessing most of you live in or around New York City or Newark, New Jersey, you know, maybe you live a little further out on um, in New Jersey, or it's maybe not as much built up. But if you look at this map of our area, you notice there's a lot of gray, right, where that's all the paved surfaces. And so what we call that 
in my um, field is impervious surface. So that's surface that water, like rainwater can't go into the ground. And if we put a land cover map on top of that with red indicating the impervious surface, you can see that our region is, is very impervious, right? It's, it's very paved. There's a lot of buildings, there's a lot of roads. And things like this can cause drought, it can cause flooding. I know my old apartment in, um, in Brooklyn, like if sometimes there'd be like an inch, not even an inch of rain would fall, half an inch of rain would fall and the whole street would be flooded, right? Another thing is we put a lot of this, especially this time of year, a lot of salt. We put a lot of salt on our paved surfaces and these things can impact plants. So that's why I studied them. I was interested in how they survive living in such a brutal place like New York City. Um, and I point this out because I'm, I'm that proud. <laughs> so pandemic starts in 2020 and uh, that's around when I was trying desperately to finish my PhD. And so I moved whatever I could from my lab in, in Newark to my apartment in Brooklyn. And I finished the research there and I was successfully able to defend in uh, May, 2020 even during a pandemic. So I wasn't able to have commencement. I don't know if you had friends that graduated that, uh, that spring, but there was no commencement. So this is the dorky like white girl thing I did was I like get on this uh, stand up paddleboard thing. And uh, that was my walk. Yeah, I know, super, super dorky. Please don't shut up. It's actually fun. <laughs> I haven't done it that many times, but it's actually fun. And, uh, and I didn't fall in, which I was equally proud of. Um, so you got to make it work. That's the point. That's the point, kids. You got to make it work. You never know what life's going to throw at you. Just try to have a good time, I guess. And so you can think of that, that in terms of this plant class too, right? You didn't know you're going to have a plant class ever, but I promise you, I'm gonna try to make you have a good time with it. Yeah. Thanks guys. It was fun. So where am I now? I'm in Michigan. <laughs> I am in Michigan. I, uh, so I defended in 2020 of May. And then I was able to get a postdoc in Michigan. I'm at Michigan State University, the Department of Plant Biology. So I actually moved to Michigan in June of 2020. Yes. And uh, I do, if, you're, if you move during a pandemic, I don't recommend it, but if you have to, it's, it is possible. Um, one thing though, is my husband still lives in, uh, he still works in New York City. So we have been going back and forth. In fact, Right now I'm in Michigan, but tomorrow I fly to New York City. So on Thursday, in Thursday's class, I will be actually coming to you from Brooklyn. Uh, I've flown a lot. But yeah, Michigan's really fun. Uh, if you like nature, um, there's a couple big cities, but if you're from New York City, there's not that many big cities. Um, but yeah, if you like nature and um, quietness, <laughs> I recommend Michigan because there's, it's pretty, uh, yeah. There's a lot of other stuff too going on. All right, enough about me, enough about me. What are we gonna do today? Not that much, but some stuff, some stuff. So one thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go over the syllabus briefly, which is pretty standard, right? Uh, talk a little bit about the course, um, which is called Plant Kingdom. And we'll talk about why plants are important, what plants are, and uh, what kind of types of plants there are, the main divisions of plants. And then before we leave for the day, we're gonna just briefly talk about something called taxonomy because we're gonna need that going into the rest of the course. Okay. This is the uh, syllabus. So I should mention um, right now, I'm, so I'm, I'm still working on developing the Canvas page. The issue is, uh, so Canvas right now, I'm trying to merge both sections of this course into a single lecture page so that uh, both sections can interact with each other on a single page. So Canvas and I are still working on doing that, hence why the Canvas page isn't very developed yet because it's probably gonna be a different page. If I don't hear back from them today, the, can the Canvas people, I will, um, if I don't hear back from them today, I will add content to the separate pages that are up there now, uh, but just an FYI as to why, um, yeah, I'm still, I'm still working on the Canvas page. But anyways, once the Canvas page is good to go, you'll be able to read the full syllabus there. So I'm not gonna go through the entire syllabus today. Um, lecture is on Zoom. 
because I'm in Michigan. Uh, lab is going to be in person as of right now. But obviously, things can always change. There's a required textbook for this course. It's Raven Biology of Plants. Uh, you can get any edition, but before you do anything, before you buy anything, I'm, I'm going to provide you a free copy of the text. So you don't have to buy a textbook. All right. I'm going to provide you a free copy of the textbook. So you do not have to buy any textbook for this course. It will be for free for you on campus. Um, so, so it will be available on Canvas, but I haven't put it there yet. Yeah, textbooks are ridiculously expensive. Um, when I was an undergrad, my biggest pet peeve were the professors that made you not only buy a textbook, but buy the newest edition. Ugh. You know, so that's not fair. Colleges are already expensive. Um, I, I had to work like so many jobs just to be able to go to college. So, so free textbook for you. Yeah. No, don't buy any books. Uh, if you want to buy one though, just so you know, you can find these, I think sometimes for like 30 bucks, but yeah, you know, you guys are welcome. Um, I, I, I've been there and then not that long ago either. <laughs> so free textbook. I had a question here in the chat box. Are all of our lectures going to be on zoom even when the university opens again? Yes. Yes. So you may not have noticed, but this um, on the course schedule, this is a hybrid course. So all lectures will be on Zoom. Lab, once the university opens again, will be in person unless something changes. Yes, okay. In addition to the free textbook, um, there will also be some supplemental stuff for you guys to read, which will be available on Canvas as well. It's not there now, but it will be. And that's just to help you guys kind of understand the material more and to help you complete the labs. Um, again, I'm not going to go through all this whole thing, but the main thing is, look, lecture is a Zoom. I will record, this is being recorded right now, so I will record the lectures and they will be posted on Canvas as well in case you arrive late or, you know, have to leave early or you miss class, you can always re-watch the lectures. However, I do take attendance um, because it's just a nice way to buff to like uh, fluff up your grade to give you points for attending the lectures. Um, if you miss class for a valid reason, you can send me documentation and then I will, you know, uh, excuse the absence to lecture. Again, lab is planning right now to be in, in person. And, and there's other ways for you to get like participation points, even if you have had to miss um, the live, the live Zoom. Um, I have a question in the chat. The labs are out in out in the field. Um, it'll depend on the labs. Most of the labs will be in if they're if, if they are held in person, um, which is the plan right now. They will be in the classroom, and then occasional journeys out into the campus. But that'll be weather permitting, because it's still mad cold. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but the main the main thing I want you to take away from this slide is assignments. There are a lot, there are a decent amount of assignments. The reason why there's a decent amount of assignments be, is because I don't want your exams to count for so much because everyone freaks out during exams and there it's a lot of material. So please do your assignments. The assignments are meant to be easy. They're meant to be easy and <clears throat> they're to help boost your grade. So turn in your assignments on time. Uh, if your assignment is turned in late, it's automatically reduced to letter grade. And if it's turned in more than two days after the deadline, you don't get any credit because that's just the way it is. So turn in your assignments on time. They're meant to be easy. How are you graded for this course? So this lecture and lab are merged together and you end up getting one grade <clears throat> for the two, right? <clears throat> There's a rubric up on the top there to show you the letter grade breakdown. But basically there's uh, exams and there's assignments and then there's attendance and participation. So, uh, wait a minute. Yes, yes, so there's two lab exams. 
there's two regular lecture exams, there's one final exam, and then there's assignments. So what I want you to take away from this breakdown here is that each exam is worth 15% of your grade, one five, 15% of your grade. But collectively assignments are worth 20% of your grade. So collectively all the assignments together are worth more than one exam. That's why I wanna do them and do them on time. Attendance I already talked about, um, but I should also mention, oh, well, in a second, uh, participation. So <clears throat> once Canvas is, you can participate in a lot of different ways. Some people like to like talk out loud during class, like some people, and if you ever have a question in class, you can like, let me know, you can raise your hand or you can just, um, you can write in the chat, I have a question and we can unmute you. So, you, so sometimes people like to do that. Sometimes people don't like to do that. And sometimes people maybe will send me an email after class with a question. That's totally fine. That counts as participation. In addition, I'm going to have on Canvas a discussion board for each uh, lecture. And so you can also earn participation points by adding things into that discussion board. And they don't have to be like rocket science, like big, big things. They can just be like, oh, I, I thought this lecture was cool because I learned that not all plants um, are able to have like vasculature, whatever. Or, oh, I thought this, this lecture was cool because I learned that why plants lose their leaves in the fall. It doesn't have to be something that's very profound, right? Um, also mentioning this because if you miss the live lecture and you watch the recording later, you can still earn particip participation, I can speak, um, participation points by interacting with that discussion board on Canvas, which is not there yet, but will be. This thing on the bottom here about missing classes. Um, yes, if you miss two labs, you should probably drop the course. Um, so so try, to, try to go to those. Um, there is no extra credit in this course. So don't ask me. Um, and the other thing is just try hard now, just start now, start working now. This, this course does cover a lot of material. I, this is my fifth time lecturing this course. So I've gotten pretty good at knowing how much responsibilities to give you guys, like how many assignments and things to give you guys over the course of the course so that you can do well. The majority of the students in my class get A's and B's. Very few people get C's, very few people get D's, and it's usually out of 44 students, one or two people get F's. How do you be the, one of those A and B people? Just start now, do those assignments, come to lecture or watch the lectures, um, and start now. This course covers too much material to cram. You can't cram this course you won't be successful you have to take it in pieces so so please start now okay this is just when you pull up the syllabus after i put it on uh, on canvas you'll see something like this and this is a breakdown of what each date what we will do um, on the right hand side you see something that says chapters and there's um, numbers there so for example, today we're doing this introduction and whatnot in lecture one, right right here, lecture one. And then you see here chapters. I'm not suggesting you go read two chapters. I'm not suggesting you go read chapter one and chapter 12. I'm just saying that all the information that I cover in today's class can be found in those chapters. So maybe you might need to refer to those, but I'm not suggesting you have to read the whole thing. Uh, we have a question, are exams cumulative? We will talk more about exams later, but um, uh, no, they are not. Um, lab syllabus, so your lab TA's name is Dr. Bruna Fonseca. This is her email address. Again, I will post the lecture slides to Canvas as well. So the recording will be there and also the slides will be there just so you know. Uh, and labs meet on Monday. Uh, most important thing to take away from this lab is that the first lab is not until January 31st. 
And that's a, as of right now, because obviously things could change. Um, there's also, in addition to the fact that I'm giving you a textbook for free, there's no lab manual to purchase for this course either. Um, all the lab materials will be made available to you for free via Canvas. Uh, recommended that before you come to lab, you read the lab handout. And it's also recommended that you define any terms before you come to lab. That way, when you're in lab, you can just do your work and go. You won't have to be starting from square one. Yeah, so no free textbook and no lab manual to purchase either. Okay. This should be boilerplate. I think most of the students in my class here are like fourth year students, usually. Don't cheat. Don't plagiarize. You should know that you shouldn't do those things. Don't work together on exams. I've been teaching a long time. So I have ways and Canvas allows me other secret ways um, to know what you're doing when you're taking uh, exams. So just please, please just, you know, I, I give what I can give to make the course easy. Don't cheat, okay? Uh, syllabus will be available on Canvas by the end of the day. Read the whole thing over and then make a note in your calendar about the dates of when assignments and exams are. Okay, enough about that boring stuff. Let's talk about plants. That's why we're here. Okay. And again, if anyone has any questions at any time, feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand. So why the heck plants, right? Why is there even a course dedicated to plants? What's the point? Um, why are plants important to us? There's a lot of reasons. We'll cover a couple of them today. When you think about why plants are important, there's a, a few different views that you can take to think about their importance. So the first one is like a biological view. So why are plants important to like the biology of our earth? Well, one reason is that they provide carbon fixation for the entire biosphere. Whoa, that's a pretty sciencey statement, right? All that means is that they take CO2 gas out of the air and turn it into sugar. That's all that means. But that's pretty important, right? So like, this is what I just said. They take CO2 gas and they convert it in this process that we'll learn more about in a future lecture, which results in the, in the production of sugar, which is pretty, pretty neat. Thank you, plants. All they use is sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide, and they turn it into sugar that we eat. Oh yeah, and then oxygen, which we breathe. Um, <clears throat> so thank you, plants. That's pretty important. Like you probably like breathing and you probably like eating. So you can thank plants for that. Not just you either. See here, basis of the terrestrial food chain. Oh, you'll few things you'll learn about me. One, I, I drink a lot of tea during class because it's hard to talk this much. And two, I love to annotate. I'm not good at annotating, but I love it. Um, so here, look. Terrestrial food chain, basis of the terrestrial food chain. That is a fancy way of saying plants feed everyone. They, they feed the insects, they feed the fish, believe it or not, they feed the mice, right? Um, everything, every, every animal, every animal, and then the animals we eat too, right? Plants feed cows and then some people eat cows. So, right, I don't eat cows, but some people eat them. Uh, and then oxygen, yes, oxygen is a little bit important. Um, it's what we need to live, <laughs> to breathe. It's one of the things we need to live. Um, so plants make that and we breathe it. So thank you plants. Okay, so that's one way they're important. Another reason they're important, that was a biological perspective, right? Carbon fixation and making oxygen, right? For organisms on earth. But we can also look at how plants are important specifically to people. So I mentioned plants are food for humankind, but we actually were able to make civilization because of the domestication of plants. So before humans domesticated plants, we, we kind of had to move around to be able to go to where there were food sources and that made it so we couldn't really stay put, kind of had to move around. Um, hunter-gather kind of idea, yeah. 
Well, once uh, around 10,000 years ago, give or take, we actually learned how to domesticate plants and that allowed us to make civilizations in many parts of the world. Um, so for example, there's three staples of civilization, rice, wheat, and corn, all of which come from grass. So rice and wheat and corn are, are, are grasses. Uh, grasses are plants. So you can see here, this is just three examples of where domestication of food allowed civilizations to be made, right? So corn in um, Central America, and then you see rice in Asia, and then wheat and barley uh, in the Middle East. This is just three examples. There's many, many, many more examples of, of how domestication of, of plants allowed civilizations to be built. Um, this is just to show you, if you don't believe me, <laughs> that rice, wheat, and corn are um, grasses. Yeah, so the, the fruit of a grass is called a caryopsis, and that's what we eat. Um, so when you're eating corn, you're eating a caryopsis, right? You're eating the fruit of a grass. Just so you see here, right? See all these like little things here? Oh, now I'm yellow. This here, that's the fruit of the wheat. That's the caryopsis, and that's what we eat. Okay. So we were able to make civilizations because we domesticated plants. In addition to that, we use them for fuel. So traditionally we use them by, for fuel by burning wood. And a lot of people still burn wood. My folks live in uh, kind of rural Connecticut and they still burn wood as fuel. <clears throat> but also things like fossil fuels. A lot of times when you hear the word fossil fuel, you think dinosaur, right? Oh yeah, like fossil fuels are dinosaurs, right? Yeah, I mean, some of it might be dinosaurs, but the majority of fossil fuels are from prehistoric plants uh, because there were a lot more prehistoric plants than there were dinosaurs, right? So coal, oil, natural gas, all of those things are uh, fossil fuels, which come from plants. And just so you know, just so you can see the process down here. So like here you see is like a prehistoric forest, right? Along millions and millions of years ago. As that material dies, it goes into the ground. And then over time you add all these things. So like you got time here, you add a bunch of pressure as more and more plants pile up on top of it. You add the pressure, you get heat. And over time, you get something like coal. S similar process to how oil uh, comes about. So plants are important biologically because of carbon fixation and oxygen. From an anthropocentric view or a human-centered view, basis of civilization, provide us fuel, provide us materials. We A lot of the clothing we wear is made out of plants, so cotton, linen, hemp, jute, et cetera. Those are all from plants. We build homes, modern and traditional homes out of plant materials like wood and even uh, palms. And even though we're using paper less and less these days, um, although we still use a lot of toilet paper and other types of paper like that, household paper, all of that comes from plants as well, for the most part, or, or from plants, yeah. Sometimes recycled, but it's still originally plants. So that's pretty important. Oh, and for you someday doctors here in the class, right? Um, plants also provide a source for medicine. So there's uh, traditional ways of using plants and then modern ways of synthesizing medicine from plants, but plants are very important in making medicines. This here is an example of a plant that is used to uh, treat malaria, which is a big problem in some places. Here is a different plant, uh, Catharanthus roseus or the Madagascar periwinkle. This is used to make cancer treatments. So that's kind of important too, right? Here's a more traditional thought of one, right? Um, the opium poppy, which is used to make all of your um, opioids, it comes from plants. So there's a lot of reasons why plants are important, right? They 
take carbon dioxide out of the air and turn it into sugar and make oxygen, right? We all eat them and animals and other organisms eat them. Humans were allowed, humans were able rather to make civilizations because of plants, um, fuel, shelter, medicine, and more. So there, that's why there's a whole class on plants because plants are pretty darn important. Um, before we go on with that, um, I should kind of put things in context of life on earth. So when you think of earth, right, there's different layers of earth. There's like the rock underground, which you can't really see that well. I should probably use a different color. I'll use, I'll use white. Um, so there's rock underground that you can't really see that well. That's the lithosphere. Then there's the terrestrial land, right? Where you and I live, right? We live on the land. That's the ecosphere. Then there's the water. That's the hydrosphere. And then there's the air, right? That's the at atmosphere. All those things together make up what's called the biosphere. And the bio, bio means living, sphere means circle or kind of you know, globe, globe thing, living globe. And so all of these things together make up the biosphere and biosphere is where all life on earth exists, where all life on earth exists. Why do I mention that? Well, because there's organisms that live in the biosphere and the organisms that live in the biosphere are divided into three domains. So this is a important word here, domain. There are three domains of the biosphere. There's bacteria and archaea, which are prokaryotic organisms. And there's eukarya which are eukaryotic organisms. Um, I always say eukarya, like, why do you wanna learn this? Because eukarya, ah, sorry, um, that's a bad joke. But yeah, so three biospheres, sorry, three domains in the biosphere. And uh, those domains are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, yeah, eukarya. Those are the three domains. Eukarya is the one we're going to talk about in this class. That's the one we care about because eukarya, yeah, we care about eukarya. Um, and there's kingdoms in the domain eukarya. Um, there's the protists, there's fungi, mushrooms and fungus, right? Animalia, which includes us, and then the plants or plantae. So those are the kingdoms of the domain eukarya. So who's in eukarya? Well, you got the protists. What are protists? Protists are like small things, right? Algae, slime molds, other types of molds, things like that. That's protists. Fungi, mushrooms, those kind of things. That's another kingdom. Some molds are in this as well. Uh, mildews and yeasts, all those fun things. Animalia, oh, little, little cute animals, right? They have eyes, some of them have fluffy fur, right? So cute, so cute, right? Animals, we're in this one, Animalia, in that kingdom. But then, ah, the plants, yes, oh, for me, I go, oh, so cute, look at the leaves, and got the little petals there, right? <laughs> um, Plant kingdom, plant kingdom, hence the name of the class. Hence the name of the class, class plant kingdom. Question in the chat box, uh, will the PowerPoint be uploaded on Canvas? It will. So these slides will be uploaded on Canvas and a recording of this lecture will also be available on Canvas. Mm -hmm. Yes, so plant kingdom, hence the name of the class, plant kingdom, right? kingdom, then this is what we're going to spend the rest of the next six, 15 weeks looking at is the plant kingdom. So there's currently about 400,000 species known, give or take, give or take. And the majority of these are called flowering plants. And we'll learn what that means later. 
Uh, but believe it or not, there's new species that are discovered every year. About 2,000 new species are discovered every, every single year. That's the average. If you wanna see examples of plants that were discovered, for example, in 2018, you can follow this link um, for an overview of that. Um, I say, you might've noticed I did this like quotations. I say discovered because um, I should, I wanna be really clear here with, in terms of language. So there are plants on earth, right? Um, and yes, like processes are happening where there could be new species that, that, that show up via the processes of evolution. But a lot of times when plants are uh, discovered, right? That means, dis that means new to science. That means discovered by science, science people and described by science people. Want to be really clear, a lot of times a plant that is quote unquote discovered has been used for thousands of years by, by people. Um, and so I want to, when I say discovered, I don't mean that it just never before was seen by humans. I want to make that very clear. Discovered just means new to science, new to science. It's important to make that distinction. Um, here's, a, here's a good example of showing that, right? So you can think of uh, the Americas. This is all the Americas, North, Central, and South America is shown on this slide here. And um, before I answer the, the question in the chat box, I'll just show here. So this is showing number of species that were discovered in the Americas, right? Starting in the 1700s. <laughs> and so you could see in the first like 100 years there, a lot of plants were discovered. Um, and over overall, right, been about 100. And if you look here, just to get you oriented, this is a cumul the black line here is a cumul cumulative line where it's adding up all the blue lines such that if we look at the span of uh, 1753 to 2010 <clears throat> ish, um, there's been a, about 120,000 species discovered in the Americas. The reason I'm pointing this out is because there's a very good, very good chance um, that people had already known about these 120,000 plants who were living in the Americas, right? But then uh, colonists came, and um, and then now they're discovering plants that are that are new, right? New to them, new to them, new to science. Uh, question here: Maybe uh, how do we determine a plant goes extinct? Um, that's a good question. The main way you determine something like that is lack of occurrence data. So, for example, if you had information about a plant being in a region. Uh, for X number of times. And if the plant is then not observed for, for say, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, depends on the plant, um, you would make a determination like that. It's, it's gonna depend on what kind of plant you're talking about. Some plants, for example, only live in a very, very small area of the world. Um, like there's a lot of there's a lot of plants that are very live in very specific habitats. Um, trying to say how, think how, how I can say it. So there might be a plant that's only ever been seen on this one island. It's only ever been seen on this one island. It's the one place it's been seen. And then if that island gets bought out by a condo association who levels the entire island and builds a bunch of luxury condos on it and then plants a bunch of like rose bushes that are not even from that island and then you go back to that island and you can't find that plant there's probably a pretty good chance that that plant has been extinct right other plants it might be more difficult if they have a more global reach um a plant might a plant species might be lost from a specific area but it doesn't mean it's lost doesn't mean it's extinct um, so it will depend on the plant species and its characteristics. Okay, but speaking of plant extinction, good job, Michelle, like <laughs> way to bring me into the next slide. Um, speaking of extinction, yes, plants are at risk. Plants are at risk for why. So on the previous slide, I said um, 
in terms of why are plants important, there was the word anthropocentric, and I should have taken the time to walk you through that word, but since I didn't, I'll do it here. So anthro, anthro means relating to people. So like you may have heard the word anthropology, right? It's kind of like the study of the history of people. Um, so anthropocene, pocene refers to like an epoch. Um, here, I'll write that here, like a ebook, right? It's like a, a, you may have heard these terms like, a, like, oh, it's an era, right? Maybe you haven't, but those are like time scales, right? Um, and so you have this, oh, we got a question here. So is it possible that indigenous groups may utilize plant species that have yet to be discovered within the scientific community? Absolutely. So again, is it possible that indigenous groups use plant species that have yet to be discovered within the scientific community? 100%, definitely, definitely, and, have, and has always been the case as well. That's what I was trying to kind of um, hint at in those previous slides is that you know, it, starting around that study looked at starting around 1750, and those are all the plants that were discovered. But the, a lot of those plants, most likely all those plants, were 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 known to indigenous people for thousands of years. Um, nowadays, so in the past, it was really sketchy, where you know colonists would go in to these indigenous communities and basically learn about the different types of plants and then discover them, right? And uh, if they turn them into any sort of like product, like a medicine and stuff, uh, historically the, the, the people who inhabited the place the plant was from would never see any sort of benefit from that, right? Historically, that's the case. Nowadays, um, if you're gonna use a plant that's discovered, uh, or new to science for something like a medical application. Nowadays, depending on what country you're in, um, there's a lot of rules about giving back to the community of which you've discovered that plant. Um, okay, Anthropocene. So the epoch, Anthropocene, you can think of as like the epoch of humans, right? Or like the age of humans is a way to think of it. Um, Anthropocene. That's where we're at now in the in the history of Earth. And what we are seeing and what we have been seeing for decades now is that we're in the sixth mass extinction of, of life organisms on Earth. So based on the fossil record um, and other te techniques, but uh, historically using the fossil record, we, we have seen that there's been five mass extinctions already, right? One of those is the dinosaurs. That's the one that you're most familiar with, right? So you can see here, um, the extinction rate now is highest since the last extinction event, which was 65 million years ago, which was the dinosaurs. But before the dinosaurs, there were four other mass extinction events. Um, just to give you an example of a study, um, there was a study that, used 13,000 plant species and found that of those 13,000, 70% are threatened with extinction. There's a really important document, <clears throat> the State of the World's Plants and Fungi, which is put out by Kew Gardens and their partners. I will put that report on Canvas. It's also available here if you just click that link. Um, and we'll, we're, we're gonna read parts of that as part of this course. But of the plants that we know of, right? Of all the plants that we know of, 99% of those are current, and this is based on that study. I think it should be, a, um, I think this, it should be a black dot. <clears throat> I'll have to double check that. But lots of plants are currently threatened and, oh, no, sorry, that's not, a, that's not, that isn't a black dot. That is with these, that's this, 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 yeah. Of the currently threatened species on Earth, threatened meaning threatened with extinction, 99% of those are threatened directly by human activities. And so why do we say this? Because plants are at risk. Plants are at risk. 
Um, when you when you see this, when you see that 99% of the currently threatened species are at risk from human activities, you're probably thinking like, oh yeah, this is like a global warming like thing or yes and no. So plants are actually really resilient compared to humans. <clears throat> so something like slow changes in temperature patterns, slow changes in temperature patterns don't affect them quite as much as like things like us. What, what, what's really putting plants at risk are, are, are us, <laughs> like literally us messing up the land um, <clears throat> or changing the land from how it used to be. So for example, based on this study, the thing that is most threatening plants with extinction is actually agriculture and aquaculture. Now, when you hear agriculture, you're probably thinking, well, aren't we growing plants? So how is that affecting plants? <clears throat> well, yeah, we grow plants, but we only grow a few kinds, right? We grow corn, we grow rice, we grow wheat, but there's, if you're thinking about the flowering plants, there's almost 400,000, well, there's almost 400,000 plants. We don't grow all those. So when we remove plants from the land in order to grow our corn and grow our rice and stuff, that's bad for plants. Um, and so agriculture and aquaculture are actually the, the largest contributing factor to putting plant species at risk of extinction. Uh, then you have something called biological resource use. That's over here. <clears throat> That's kind of a collective term that can be stuff like, um, oh, I'm going to harvest, uh, I'm going to harvest these trees to make them into paper, or I'm going to harvest this moss bog to use for fuel or stuff like that. It, it's kind of a collective term. Um, but yeah, you could see here, all these are, so these are all like things people do dramatically changing the landscape. And those things are the things that directly and largely threaten plants with extinction, right? Residential and commercial development. And then humans move all over the world. And when we move things all over the world, we move invasive and problematic species all over the world. And those can impact plants. And then yes, pollution and climate change is here. Those also affect plants. But the main thing I want you to take away from this slide is in terms of plant species, not human species, plant species, the things that are messing up them the most are agriculture and aquaculture. That's the thing that's messing them up the most, okay. Um, so why do I mention all that? Because it's important to appreciate plants and that's why I've fought to have this course. Um, I, this course used to be taught by Dr. Casper. I used to TA it for him. He retired and there was no plan as to how to keep this course going. So as a graduate student, I actually became the lecturer of this course because I fought with the department to not cancel it. Also, you guys need lab courses. There's, there's not enough lab courses at Rutgers Newark. And so if this course got canceled, that would also, you'd also lose another lab course, which you guys can't afford to because you want to graduate, right? But plants are really important to me. Plants are really important to all of us. It's important to appreciate plants and it's important to kind of understand what we're doing to affect them negatively and to try to counter that with things like sustainable practices and conservation efforts, right? We want to do things that will help maintain plant species because they do a lot of stuff for us. Okay, we're almost done here. The last thing we have to talk about is um, taxonomy. So these are the divisions of the plant kingdom. So plant kingdom is in that domain you care, yeah, yeah, right? And within the plant kingdom, there are different divisions. And this is where we're gonna spend the rest of the semester learning about. So the first thing we'll learn about is the non-vascular plants, mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. Then we will move up into the vascular plants. As the course goes on, we'll learn about the spore-bearing plants, the ferns, lycopods, and horsetails. Then we'll go into the seed plants, and in the seed plants, we'll learn about the gymnosperms, which are the conifers, cycads, 
and ginkgo. And then lastly, the flowering plants. So this is a roadmap for the rest of the semester. And we'll see this roadmap several times throughout the course of the semester just to keep us oriented. This is like our subway map, right? This is what I think of like when I look at this, this is like, this is our route. Okay, before we, before we end, we just have to talk briefly about something called biological taxonomy. It's a big mouthful, but it basically is the science of naming organisms. So every organism on earth, every has, its, has a specific name. So let's take an example with humans. Um, humans are in the domain Eukarya, right? Because we're animals, right? Because we're in the kingdom Animalia. Humans have a spinal cord. So we're in the phylum Chordata. We're mammals, right? We make milk and we have fur and we're warm blooded. So we're in mammals. We're in the order primates. We're in the family hominidae. And then these are the ones I want you to really notice. We're in the genus Homo and our species name is Homo sapiens, right? Homo sapiens. So every single human on earth is a Homo sapiens. That's the name of our species. Um, but yeah, I should just point out here real quick. So our species name is Homo sapiens and we're in the genus Homo. Every species name will include the genus as the first word, just so you know. So we're the only, we're the only species left in Homo. Um, so there's no other Homo, like there's no other Homo, there's no Homo erectus left. There's no any of those left. Uh, but if they were, if there are, if there were other species in our genus, they would have that same beginning. That'll be clearer as we go on. So that's an example with humans. So you know, you're going to see this in the lab material. The plural of phylum is phyla, and the plural of genus is genera. Genera. You'll see those words sometimes in lab. Okay. So we just did an example with humans. Let's do an example with a plant, right? So this is that Madagascar periwinkle we saw before that helps uh, make cancer medicines. So it's also in the domain eukarya, right? The eukaryotic organism, but it's a plant. So it's in the plant kingdom, plantae. It's a flowering plant. So it's in the phylum Magnoliophyta. Um, and then mainly don't worry about the other stuff. I wanna show you again, the genus and the species name. So this plant species is in the genus Catharanthus and its species name is Catharanthus roseus. Notice once again, right? The genus name is the first word of the species name. That's always the case, just like homo and then homo sapiens, right? Okay. Why am I mentioning this? This is boring, right? Why, why, is, why is Rebecca doing this to us? It's the first day, this sucks. I know, I know. Well, it's, this is life. <laughs> um, anyway, this is important because you have to understand these words. You have to understand domain and kingdom and phylum and genus and species. Because when we go on to learn about all the different types of plants, we're gonna have to use these words. So it's just better to get it out of the way now and you can go forward knowing them, like what they are, or at least a sense. So why do we have biological taxonomy? Why do we have this? So there's this um, guy, right? Carl Linnaeus, who, I mean, let's, let's like be honest here. This is what most scientists look like for many, 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 too many years, right? Old white dudes. Um, that's changing now, right? That's changing now slightly, but we still have a lot of way we need to go with that. But this guy, very, very important person in terms of biology, Carl Linnaeus, we have to give him some big mad props. 
um, because he is the one who single-handedly created this, this scientific naming system, which is um, called binomial nomenclature. Um, so what is that? That's this system where every species name has two parts, the genus and the specific epithet. So just so it makes sense for the word binomial nomenclature, because that's kind of a mouthful, right? Well, bi means two, no meal means name. So two name, and then nomen means name, and clature means system. So this is a two named naming system, two named naming system, and those two names are the genus and the specific epithet, which makes the species name. So each species name will have these two parts. And this makes it so that every organism on earth has a specific species name. This is really important because if you're gonna be making, for example, you're gonna be making cancer medicine out of this plant. You don't wanna tell a colleague in another country, oh yeah, so what you do is you go out and you find this purple flower and then you do stuff to that purple flower and you make cancer medicine out of it. No, that's not gonna be good. You, you need to use the very specific plant you're talking about. And so that's why we have these, these species names so that scientists and, and people who study plants can be very clear about who they're talking about. And this same for animals too. We have the same thing for animals. So just to hit it home, right? Species is a genus plus the specific epithet. So for humans, right? Homo is the genus. For that Madagascar periwinkle, we just looked at Catharanthus is the genus. And the specific epithet is the second word for the human sapiens and for the Catharanthus, it's Roseus, right? So Homo sapiens is a species name. Catharanthus Roseus is a species name, each of which can consists of two names, two words, because of this two name naming system or binomial nomenclature. Okay, this is the last thing. Um, just, just a little stylistic stuff. So if you write a species name, it has to either be underline or italicized. Um, so example, like for Homo sapiens, you can write it underlined or italicized. Uh, the first word, for example, homo, is always capitalized. The second word is never capitalized. And sometimes if you're reading a scientific journal article or even the textbook or even your lab manual, it's just good to know that if you've already mentioned the thing, you can just use the first letter. So like if you're like, oh, homo sapiens, first domesticated food, blah, 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 blah. And then later, if you refer to them again, you could just say H dot sapiens. I'm just pointing that out because sometimes in the lab it does that and you might think it's a typo or be unclear. Um, and then if you're talking about a lot of different species in one genus, you add this little SP. So you could be like all the species in the genus Cantharanthus, Cantharanthus SP or Cantharanthus SP. This, this is just for you to know when you're looking at the lab material. Okay. Um, I'm gonna give you guys a little homework. It's not a big deal. It, it's like literally 500 words, not even, um, it's not there yet, but I'm gonna put that state of the world plants and fungi um, on Canvas. And before next class, just give it a read. It says pages two to nine, but just so you know, like the majority of those pages have pictures on them. So it's not, it's not a, it's a magazine article, all right? It's not a real journal article or anything. So I will post that on Canvas. I'll probably do that now, even though I'm waiting to hear about the merged course from the Canvas people. Uh, and then the next class, we will talk about alternation of generations, which is a super important component of um, this course. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. And if you guys 
uh, don't have any questions, you're free to go. And I will see you on Canvas or see you on Thursday. Um, just an FYI, like I said, for anyone came late, lab doesn't start until the 31st of January. Uh, yes, uh, Kiana? Hi, hello. Hi, uh, did I say your name correctly? Yes, yes, you did. Thank you. <laughs> just checking. Um, I was wondering about the PowerPoints, right? Will they be uploaded with the video or will we like be able to like um, look it over before class? Good question. So um, definitely the, the PowerPoint slides will ultimately end up on Canvas, um, usually shortly after class occurs. There is, um, I usually don't post the slides before class because sometimes I notice a typo in the slides during class. And so I like to be able to fix any problems before I upload it onto Canvas. Um, but typically they'll be available about 20 minutes after class meets. Okay, thank you. And oh, and the, the uh, link to the recording will also be available on Canvas. Alrighty, thank you so much. Thank you, have a good one. You too. Uh, I think, did I see another question here? Uh, oh, do we get, so Hawa, Hawa, am I saying your name correctly? Or maybe Hawa yes. already. Oh, okay, great. Um, so you asked, do we get a study guide for exams? You do. Uh, you'll get a study guide for every single exam, including lab exams. And I always provide you the study guide at least one week before the exam. Okay, thank you. Always. Thank um, you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for asking. Uh, let's see, any other questions before we head out? I look forward to meeting all of you. I, I know it's still frustrating to be on the Zoom, but uh, I think for now it's safer and um, I'm in Michigan, so <laughs> it's necessary for us uh, as well. Um, I had a question about the format of the exam. Sure, Michelle. Yes. So, will we need a specific, um, like, uh, browser tool? Like, um, before some schools use U Proctor, I believe, or Proctor U, and Lockdown Browser, or will it be like Lock Through Canvas? Yeah. So, um, I'm not a hundred percent sure yet. Um, I think what I'm gonna do, is, and one nice thing is. The way that we do assignments is the same general format of like how exams will run. So it allows me to, to make sure everything is working seamlessly on both of our ends before we do something like an exam. So I'm, I don't think we will need anything. I don't currently plan on using anything that fancy. Um, like. I'm okay if people want to refer to like notes or something like that during an exam. I know people are gonna do that anyways. Um, so using like a lockdown browser, I'm not planning on doing anything like that. But that being said, I've had people in the past that have tried to like watch the lectures during the exams, which have like totally frozen their whole everything. And it was just not, it was bad. So, so for example, I give a study guide. I'm okay if somebody makes like a little, like with the study guide, a couple notes. Um, but yeah, a lockdown. I'm I'm not planning on filming anybody while they're taking the exam. Let's put it that way. Okay. Thank you so much. No problem. Have a good one. Me too. Uh, so Hala, so is it fine to use our note during exam? So Hala, um, and am I saying your name correctly? Yes, great. Um, you know, here's the thing. This is a Zoom lecture and you're gonna be taking the exams online. Um, I'm not gonna be in the room with you. I can't, I, I know people are going to find ways to, to do something. Like, I know people are probably gonna look at notes during the exam. I'm okay with, with something like that. Um, meaning, you know, you, you read this study guide and you made notes like, to help you do well based on the study guide. That being said, I'll say it's good to prepare for exams. It's good to 
download the study guide and make careful notes using the study guide and not simply relying on having access to PowerPoint slides and not simply relying on having access to like random notes that you did. Because the exams take the information that I give you and kind of put it together. So you have to have an understanding of the material in order to do well on the exam. I don't know if that helps, um, but yeah, I'm not in your house. I know, I know how students are. I know that students are probably going to be using notes on the exam. So I'm okay with that. I would just caution, you should still really study. <laughs> That's the best way I can say that. How many questions on exams? I don't know how, uh, um, I haven't written them yet. Uh, but, but typically I'd say from past, past experiences, like maybe 40 to 50, something like that. But I don't know, that could be less, maybe 35. Is it multiple choice? Um, yeah, typically the majority of the questions are multiple choice. There may be additional uh, short essay, um, fill in the blank, um, matching. Um, short answer, but but the majority of the questions will be multiple choice. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other questions? Give it a few seconds here, just in case. All right, guys. Well, if you if you do have a question and you want to um, ask it and you didn't have time or you're shy, feel free to email me. Okay. And I will talk to you guys on Thursday. <clears throat> Have a great rest of your day.